I'm Keith McCullen. Welcome back. This is the sixth conversation I've had in two days. We do three per day and uh, certainly last today, but uh, not the one that uh, most of you would say is ever last when it comes to having an opinion. And uh, I'm quite happy to welcome you back to Hedge Eye TV, uh, Mr. Jim Chanos. It's, it's great, to, great to have a conversation with you. Good to see you, Keith. Thanks well, for having me. You, you, you look great, and you're back on the prowl, you know, like as you would be. <laughs> so he's, you know, so Chanos is doing his class at Yale. Uh, I think we have a, a picture of the new uh, business school at Yale. He's got his new class, and it's, you know, back for, for more. It's bigger than it's ever been, and I want to get into that quickly. Um, and, and you said you're going back and forth between Yale and New York, and that's kind of your gig until May? Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm, and uh, I'm actually in Miami for most of the winter, so uh, I've had to put up with the crypto bros um, in, in Miami for the last couple of weeks. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fine. I'm in New York and New Haven early in the week and uh, in Miami uh, late in the week. Well, th 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 we got to get right into it on that front, on the crypto front. I mean, what an amazing thing to have Jim Chanos walk in. I think you said you have like 60 students. Uh, you, you, you walk into, a, a guy walks into a room and he's not bullish on crypto at a, at a, at a big, you know, Ivy League college. Like, what gives? <laughs> well, I mean, I, it, it's, it's one thing to have a view on, on, on being bullish on prices. It's another to sort of question a lot of uh, the underlyings. And I think that's, that's one of the things that that concerns me about the space is just what are the economic drivers that will will fund this massive infrastructure that that uh, Silicon Valley and now Wall Street are building around it. Um, you know, when you look at, at some of the economics behind it, it, it other than than price going up and to the right on the various coins, it's hard to see. Uh, where where the long term economics are? Uh, Bitcoin mining has returns now, but those will diminish with time, and is very capital intensive. And then all the various wacky lending programs, where you you lend out your uh, Bitcoin on an exchange and and uh, into a stable coin, and and then you know someone pays you quote unquote eight uh, percent or ten percent or twelve percent. Um, you know, I, I just keep asking, what's the economic engine behind that? And, and I, I can't get good answers. And that's, that's what's concerning because that's what raises the issues of, of a Ponzi scheme where you're just being paid off by the proceeds of other people lending. Um, and then of course we can get into NFTs, which is kind of the, 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 the fraud playground of, uh, of crypto. Yeah, the, the, the Ponzi piece on you know, the proceeds of other people lending, like that's something, like to me, I just can't do it. I mean, it's not like I don't have some capital that I could allocate to, you know, to that kind of a return. Uh, I just don't, I, I want the return of my capital. Um, is there anything there that you've sunk your teeth into? I know you've sunk your, you know, your talons into Coinbase, like on that, on that specific topic that, 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 that you could educate people on. Yeah, well, Coinbase is sort of a different story, and Coinbase is just over earning. Um, but but what really concerns me is some of the, the stuff that's going on at, in, in the sideshows, the rug pulls, um, the various different hacks, and and you know it's very very hard for people to get their accounts insured. The exchanges are insured, but the accounts aren't insured for the most part. Hmm. And it gets back to actually one of the guys I teach about in my class, John Law, who might be the greatest. You know, financial fraudster of all time, but he was also one of the first sort of serious thinkers about fiat currency. And one of his ideas was that uh, people will distrust fiat currency for all the obvious reasons, debasement, printing of money, all the things we know about. But the state does have the ability to be a lender of last resort and adjudicate fraud in times of, of stress and risk. And while he didn't uh, say it specifically, he alluded in a couple of instances to the ability of the state to also provide in deposit insurance. And so there's lots of things that fiat has that are advantages that the decentralized crypto uh, world doesn't have. And I think that's that's kind of an important point. But but more importantly to this discussion is what are the economic drivers, what are the financial drivers, what are the business models that, that underlie a lot of this excitement about crypto. And, and, and that's where it's kind of hard to, to find anything that looks sustainable. Well, when you say Coinbase is over-earned, can you explain that? Yeah, so 
Uh, their their really their revenues uh, uh, recently were roughly annualized were about four percent of the assets they have under their umbrella, and and just to put that in perspective, you know, and by the way, Coinbase is really more like a broker dealer than an exchange. Um, Schwab is Schwab. Uh, I think revenues to assets are uh, somewhere around twenty basis points, twenty five basis points for a trading operation. Usually, revenues it might be one percent to one and a half percent. Of assets, um, and 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 here these guys are at four uh, percent. They're being undercut by fees. The retail accounts are paying, you know, as much as twenty to forty times as much as the institutional accounts are at Coinbase. So all of that's just going to get competed down. And 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 you know, this is not a call on the price of Bitcoin or Dogecoin or anything like that. It's just simply they are over earning like any broker dealer does at the beginning parts of a bull market or the end parts of a bull market when retail gets involved. Retail flooded into Coinbase in 2020 and 2021. They earned a ton of money on it. Uh, but now that volumes are down and, and commissions are coming down, uh, it's going to be a different story. Well, it's an interesting and one. They're not making money. They'll lose money on a gap basis this year, um, even though they had just monster earnings last year. Um, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. And so, you know, the stock at, at wherever it is, 160 bucks, um, and not making money in the next handful of years with a book value somewhere a little bit north of $20 um, seems a pretty rich undertaking to us. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there, subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. Well, especially if it's a broker dealer that had a bunch of bubble stocks in its brokering. I mean, you got um, Mike Green made this point yesterday. I mean, twenty seven hundred um, you know, token IPOs through Coinbase. I mean, like that's all in the numbers, right? Like that's that's what got you yeah. there. Um, I think you call yeah. it you call Coinbase itself a bubble stock, but we're talking about bubbles inside of bubbles. Like you couldn't quite actually find one stock to short, you know, in the prior bubble that you were successful in shorting <laughs> that could really capture well, well, we were, all we were, the bubbles. <laughs> we were short Robinhood for, for, for most of last year and into this year. And, and Robinhood has come down, obviously, quite a bit. Robinhood now trades at less than one and a half times tangible book. And okay. it's losing money. It's got basically, you know, the same profile and in some cases the same type of client base that Coinbase does. And you know that would put that would put Coinbase somewhere between thirty and forty dollars. Um, wow. It gives you an idea of the of the the risk here in the name. Uh, you know, and same thing with with uh, you know take a look at at SoFi. Um, SoFi is trading at, at at slightly over one times book. Um, so these a lot of these um, uh, DeFi companies or fintech companies are kind of one by one falling back to earth as people realize that the business models are far more pedestrian than people think. Well, it's, and in another one that you nailed on this front, not to get away from crypto uh, fully here, because I'm sure we'll come back, but, you know, DraftKings. I mean, you've been, I, I think you've, I mean, you're short this stock from a very high level. Did you stay with something like that? And again, it's the same kind of community, right? We have, it's different this time, big TAMs, a lot of idiots gambling, buying shit, selling shit, crypto stocks, you know, SPACs. It's all kind of like you're short the same customer base, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm short the guy that came up to me in Miami on, on Friday afternoon uh, and, and yelled across the bar, hey, you're the dude that short Coinbase. And he, I kid you not, he had a cosmopolitan in his hand. Um, and <laughs> he was there for the crypto conference. It's All the right. same people. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but, but you get the idea. Um, yeah, DraftKings is kind of the, I mean, DraftKings was, was right time, right place for that business, right? I mean, we were all inside. Online gambling was being uh, enacted by state after state. Uh, now it's basically in 40% in, in of the population. Um, but it's profitless prosperity. I mean, the, the, the online gambling guys are basically, you know, giving you, uh, giving you $2 to gamble a dollar. And in the interest of, of, of growing their revenues and growing the TAM, but sports betting is not a particularly good business. I keep telling people <laughs> there is a reason that the sports book occupies the worst real estate in any casino and that you can't get comped on even a billion dollar Super Bowl bet. Um, it's just a very, very low margin business. You're basically selling a commodity. You're selling a money line. 
And so when you're selling a money line with four or five other deep pocketed people who are also willing to lose money, um, you're going to see the kind of numbers that we're seeing in the U.S. And, and the TAM numbers are way too high. Um, by our estimates, if you get 80 percent of the country um, gambling, you won't get Texas. This number of Sunbelt states you just won't get. If you get 80 percent of the adults in legalized gambling venues for sports betting, um, the TAM estimates, you know, a year or so ago were twenty five billion dollars in industry revenue. We think it's now running probably closer to nine to ten billion with 80 percent. Um, and that's just not going to there's not going to be enough money there for everybody, given how much money they're all spending. So, you know, DraftKings is, is just losing buckets of money. Um, and uh, I think we'll continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And the question will be, how long can they continue to fund that? And how long will investors let them continue to fund that um, before they kind of have to retrench and rethink their model? Yeah, it's interesting. If you go, um, first of all, all, uh, all companies I've asked you about so far and the one I'm going to ask you about next, which is Beyond Belief Meat, we have models. I got analysts on all of them. You know, they're, they're stocks that we don't, you know, like particularly DraftKings, we've not liked it. Um, and every time I get on our morning meeting, Jim, it's like in my old seat, which is, you know, obviously doing what you do. Yeah, it's like, why can't the stock get cut in half from here? Like, you, you, you keep asking, I keep asking the same questions over and over. Same thing with, which we'll get to, um, you know, BYND, um, you know, Beyond Meat. The, those two analysts that I have, I mean, we look for two things. We look for rate of change slowdown in the revenue growth with a big multiple. If I have those two things, then the only thing that's going to get me to stop shorting that stock is a rate of change acceleration, um, and, you know, at least in the top line and hopefully in cash flows. Like, yeah. I, I don't, it, 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 can you give people, I, I short stocks different than you short stocks. You, ta- you teach people how to short stocks, obviously, your own way. Is it, is it, is it too simple to, to not stay with those shorts than just that way, looking for the, um, what may not be a, a, an acceleration, by the way. You may never get an acceleration. I, I don't know. So I would add one one factor to that. We look at the same thing, Keith, but but we're also looking for in, in many cases, not all, but in, ca- in many cases, inherent unprofitability. Right. So that if you have if you have an insanely high valuation, you have rate of change decelerating in your top line, and you're already losing money or on the borderline of losing money, like like Coinbase, for example. Then you've got the triple threat, right? You've got a, you, you can argue then at that point that if the growth guys can't see a huge TAM being reached because revenue growth has turned negative or is, or is flattening out and margins are so negative that, that you can't grow your way out of the problem anymore and the stock is you know, still at eight times revenues or six times revenues, you know, maybe down from 10 or 12 times revenues, but companies like that often go broke. And, and so... That is, um, that is, I think, the sweet spot. There are lots of those stories in the marketplace right now. A I mean, lot of them. Trem- I mean, a lot I- of them came public and were promoted in 2020 and 2021. Well, the difference between this time and when I got into the business, and you're a wily veteran at that point on the short side, uh, 1999, 2000, 2001, like the people that aren't in the business anymore, Jim, that, that came out of the same Yale campus that, that, that we just you know, showed, that beautiful new building, yeah, they're, they're just the ones that didn't understand that. Like, I got lucky because I covered the consumer, right? So I wasn't the tech or the telecom analyst, so I couldn't fuck it up fast enough, right? And, and now, but, but we're in a place where even on my own research calls, I'll hear, you know, our own analysts talk about a stock that's trading instead of 30 times revenue, it's trading at 20 times or 10 times revenue. What is, what is it about this one? We have way more market cap. Obviously, we have way more liquidity that funded the market Much cap. Much bigger. You know, Much so, bigger. So yeah. what, like, do you, do you feel the need to even, like, even if only intellectually tie them together, um, the, the, that bubble and this bubble, or is this just in orders of magnitude? No, I, I, I've told clients that, that, that what we saw in 2019, 2020, and first half of 2021 was really the dot-com era all over again, except on steroids. Um, that the number of really crazy dot-com stories, the ones we all kind of remember, you go back and look at them, their market caps were actually not that big. No. <laughs> um, right. you know, pets.com was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Some of the, you know, obviously you have the Cisco's, which, I, which you know, to me, Tesla is today's Cisco, that were, were real companies that had real market caps. But, but you know, 
the stock went down 90% and still isn't back to those levels. But those were, were rare. Um, you Really, the, the sort of garden variety kind of crazy valuation, the dot-com era, was $2 billion to $4 billion that kind of went to 200 to $400 million. Right. And today, those, those ideas a year ago um, were often $20 billion to $40 billion. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just meaningfully, meaningfully larger market caps for, for what are basically glorified business plans that may or may not ever work out. And, and that's the difference between what happened last year and what happened in 2000. Um, you just saw the size of deals, the amount of money people were pouring into these sort of questionable business models. And the, the, the sort of fantastical TAMs that people came up with to justify the valuations was really, you know, one for this generation. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I remember, you know, shorting fogdog.com. I mean, again, I was a consumer analyst. And if you're looking for rate of change slowdown in, in the year 2000, you got it. If you're looking for companies that had epic market caps and multiples, you got it. And a lack of profitability. There's check, check, check. You know, you could do okay on Jim Chanos's you know class at Yale if he tests you on that. Um, but the crypto side of the bubble. No, you need fraud. You need fraud for my yeah, class. Oh, you need but fraud we have too. Some of that too. Well, fraud, man. I, I I just watched that bloody WeWork thing on Apple TV. We we uh, we imploded or whatever it's called. Oh my God! I mean, these things are. I just like it's just not the life I live. I can't, I can't believe that people got away with this and got funded. By the way, a lot, uh, just for your viewers, a lot of people don't realize WeWork went public in November. Yeah, <laughs> so we're short. It, I mean, it, it, it stuck out through via SPAC. Um, yeah. So it's still there. So back on the on the crypto side, you know, like it's one thing to debate, you know, whether it should go from you know ten times revenue to five times revenue to something times cash flow if they actually have cash flow. But the bubbles, like Doge, whatever the coins are, like how how do you put that in your own you know in your own version? of financial market history. Yeah, well, so, so the trading in those things all peaked in the first half of last year. Uh, and that's, that's one of the problems that Coinbase has, is they're, they're up against you know, that, that mania. Right. Um, you know, when, when, when Elon was, was touting Dogecoin, for example, and, and any coin kind of went to the moon you know, upon, uh, upon initiative. That's not happening today. And, and if you look at sort of the second derivative, the prices of NFTs, um, not only has activity cratered, but pricing by, by many accounts is now down uh, for a lot of NFTs, um, same sale, you know, down 40, 50, 60 percent since January. Um, so there's a lot of carnage that's occurred in, in the second or third um, uh, derivatives of this of this space, as you would kind of expect, right, as, as people yeah. floated more and more kind of. Um, ideas to take your money, and and um, I think that that that's the the real problem. There's people sitting on a fair amount of losses in the crypto system that that, that a lot of people aren't aren't uh, acknowledging because they're looking at some of the big coins that have basically held their values. Mm-hmm. Have you looked at um, the maestro, as I like to call them, the MSTR, sh- on the short side? <laughs> well. Well, remember, MicroStrategy was one of the great stories in 2000. Um, if, we want to, if, we want to square, if we want to square the circle at Mr. Saylor, uh, you know, that was, that was one of the stocks that, that almost kicked off the bear market in tech stocks in, uh, in April, uh, March, April, May of 2000. Uh, the, there, was some, there was some issue with the accounting, as I recall. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, we've looked at it, and, and uh, we, we actually uh, did a trade in it a year ago when it got at a monster premium to the underlying assets. And we, you know, we look at it from time to time. We don't have a current position in it, but, uh, but we do look at it as, a, as a, a play. It's a leverage play on crypto. I mean, you've got, it's a two-edged short, right? You've got a leverage play on it, but then you also have optionality value um, through the equity structure. So, um, you know, it's kind of a high risk, high reward way to play crypto trading at a premium is probably the way I would look at it. It, it trade Bitcoin, the implied value of the Bitcoin is, uh, is trading at a premium. The problem that he will have and others will have is when you have really true real-time ETFs. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember when, I, when um, I, I, we sort of uh, unveiled uh, the Coinbase idea um, on TV and, and, and everyone kind of jumped down our throats within the next 24 hours 
saying, you know, the old guy doesn't understand anything. <laughs> and, and one of the biggest fools on crypto said, you know, it, it, it's it's he doesn't get it. Chainos doesn't get it. There's going to be ETFs in this and there's going to and, and the big wirehouses like Morgan and, and Goldman and Merrill are all going to be trading crypto. And I just said, yeah, exactly. That's the bear case, not the bull case. If you're making just ridiculously large spreads on all this stuff and you're going to get ETFs and you're going to get big banks putting capital behind trading it, you're not going to keep charging people two and four percent commissions one way on, uh, on trading uh, what's basically a commodity. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, as 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 many of the points are that you make. The um, you know, the reason why I ask you about the mic uh, the maestro is because I was thinking about you know Adam uh, what's his name Adam Newman from WeWork and his behavior, and I think of Mr. Hope.com out there with the laser eyes. You know, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean yet you're a fraud if you behave that way, but it's 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 not normal behavior. Let's just say it say it that way. Um, do, do, do you have any thoughts on that beyond what you've already said, like in terms of... The, no, I mean, the, look, as I said, there's a whole infrastructure, you know, a fear of missing out infrastructure that has been built around the fact that we don't want to miss this next big thing, right? right. That's just, that the fear of missing out grips all of Silicon Valley and Wall Street pretty much at this point. And, and that's what you would expect after a 10-year bull market in technology stocks. Um, everything up to now has worked. And so you don't want to miss the next big thing. The problem is, is that the last few big things had economic engines behind them that actually kind of you could understand. Um, and I'm still straining to find the economic engines behind the metaverse and, and a lot of crypto and a lot of crypto trading and crypto lending and stable coins. It's just really when you try to keep drilling down into the economic engine that powers you know, power to profitability to support the infrastructure, you can't find it. And, and, and it kind of, it still keeps boiling down to, you know, price goes up and to the right. That's why I'm, that's why I'm involved. Well, that, that's, mean, a scary, that's a scary, uh, that's a scary basis to, to build the whole industry based on. Well, I mean, they scared a, they've scared a lot of people into, into not wanting to YOLO or FOMA or whatever the hell you want to call it. I mean, it's not like, if you take somebody that's in between my and your age, Let's just say, let's say it that way. Let's let's make it a Yale Princeton maybe, uh, you know, tilt you against Novogratz. Like he's, you know, he's he's worth he's, he's worth a B or sir multiple Bs. And people look at a guy like that and they say, well, since he he likes it, you know, let's not notwithstanding his financial incentives to like it, but people like that really get people thinking they they could miss the boat. Sure, but that's as old as human nature. I, I think I think it was Bernard Baruch who said, you know, the the greater the mania, the higher the intellect that succumbs to it. Right. So that's I mean that that I mean to me that's there has been like an institutional pressure that I've I've come to realize here internally. Like we have a daily crypto. Tr I just basically show people how to look at the bloody risk of the damn prices right. at a bare minimum, so that they can understand what they're dealing with from a risk management the, perspective. Right. Yeah. The um, que the question you should ask yourself is. How and why, not who, right? And the, 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 in every great short we, we've been involved with, there have been, been really, really smart people who owned it, right? And, and we couldn't ever figure out why. And consequently, you know, we're considered reasonably decent short sellers and we've been dead wrong on lots of things. Yeah. And if you shorted something just because Kinecos and Chanos were shorted, you're not doing your homework. Mm -hmm. It works both ways. And, and so... That's what I keep asking about about the crypto space is don't add, don't tell me who's involved. Uh, um, tell me why they're involved and how they're involved and, and, and what is the underlying economics. That's the key thing that you should ask yourself. How is it that these exchanges can pay you 12 percent if you lend them your your coins? What yeah. are they doing to earn more than 12 percent? That is such an excellent way to, to, to simplify, like, how one yeah. should approach it. I mean, the, the who part, I mean, like, I, I can go back to the peak of it. I could be on the side. I have four kids, so if you multiply them all playing three sports, you know, I'm on a lot of different sidelines and in rinks. Uh, and and, and by the, by, actually, by this time last year, it was all about who was going to. I have a friend at Morgan Stanley who's got this one crypto that they're going to start promoting over here. And that's what it, that's what it got to. You know, that, that was all about who. 
from people that have never made money in markets in their life. And that to me, I mean, again. Yeah, and how is, that, how is that not different from just basically NASDAQ stock speculation? You know, yeah. I've got a stock I'm going to promote that doesn't make any money, but, you know, could be the next big thing. Get in on it. Well, it's it, no different. It, well, it's just that it, it's the old, it's just like the, you know, casino floor. You bring in the lowest quotient. Uh, you put them on the, the, the lowest value play. Like if you could buy something for two cents, you know, on some crypto exchange, you're in. You know, you buy it for two cents and it goes to 10 cents. So you, don't, you don't have to be a wizard to understand the return. And that's what drew in yep. a much bigger, you know, a bigger balance, I think, of people. Do you think that when this, you know, if and when this all comes crashing down, which happens, uh, as I call it, in quad four, and that's when, again, as opposed to, I don't have to have a defunct economy like Sri Lanka this morning, um, but or a, 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 somebody to default on their on their sovereign <laughs> debt. But you know, as long as I have the rate of change of the economy slowing and the rate of change of corporate profits slowing, in this case, we think corporate profits can go from basically thirty percent to towards zero percent in the aggregate over a two quarter period uh, from the fourth quarter. Like to me, these quad four conditions perpetuate crashes of prices, the crashes of imbalances. Like, well, I, I, Keith, I would ask a, I would ask a more important question. When you say profits, how are you defining them? Are you probably yeah. a, a real profits or pro forma <laughs> as adjusted profits? Because that's the other big problem going on out here is that companies now, and, and the SEC is really, in my view, has dropped the ball on this, is, is companies are just have licensed to basically report things pretty much any way they want to. And, and, and they certain, obviously yeah. take advantage of that. So... So Coinbase, again, not, not to beat a dead horse, but Coinbase is a great example. I think the street estimate right now is, is for them to, uh, to make adjusted EPS this year two and a half dollars. Um, it was 14 last year. And, and, but, but the gap uh, numbers are, are lost. You know, the gap estimate is for a loss of, I think, over a dollar. That's well, a, a three and a half dollar swing between your adjusted profit and your actual loss is, I think, material. Mm -hmm. And and we continue to let companies sort of, you know, tell you how they want to show their numbers and what costs they want to exclude. And I think the the gap between reality and, and pro forma has never been greater. Do you think that the new? Um, it's like one of the only, uh, I guess, the divisions in the White House that has somebody run, a new running it. Do you, do, you think, do you think that he? Do you think the new sheriff in town is going to be a sheriff or just uh, whistling past the graveyard on this? Look, I, I think Gary Gensler uh, seems seems to be, you know, saying the right things and moving in the right direction um, in a lot of places. But you know, a it's a committee. He's the chair of a committee, right? right. There are five commissioners. Um, and the SEC is under lots of political pressure. Uh, you know, post GameStop and AMC last January, um, you know, the, the number of congressional committees that were, were beating on the SEC, and he had barely started. In fact, I don't think he had started for a while. Um, you know, to do something, uh, to, do, to do something about uh, short sellers. Meanwhile, short sellers got run over the whole thing. Um, and, and, and a variety of other things that kind of were just politically oriented. Um, it was really intense. And these people hold his purse strings and have oversight. So, you know, he's in a tough spot. I, I, you know, they, they've got to deal with, uh, they're trying to deal with crypto with Treasury, figure out a framework for that. Um, you know, he's got, uh, of course, political pressure on the green disclosure, which is a whole other issue. And, uh, and then a variety of things. But I, the one thing I would say, if, if Chairman Gensler is listening in, uh, you've got to attack this pro forma stuff. It, it mm -hmm. is really, people will probably lose more money on that than almost anything else going forward on believing structurally unprofitable companies are profitable somehow. Mm, that's, um, well, you eventually you find that one in the unemployment line too, because again, you can't just print jobs with, with fake with fake monies all the time, right? I mean, so that's going to be part of how the story. I think the people are going to get pounded. I mean, if you if you if you put X amount into whatever NFT or crypto, and you're just getting pounded, and then, then you lose your job, and here we are. There's a lot of components to how this could get nasty faster. Um, on that, like just just to give you an open shot at it, are are there any companies that because I don't um, I don't know what you've said most recently on this topic, but are there any companies out there that we haven't talked about that you do think uh, fit that profile um, you know most specifically? 
Well, I, we are we are cautious. I said in the whole on the whole fintech space, right? The 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 whether it's the buy now pay later companies or or it's the the subprime lenders and drag, um, and and a lot of them are are selling the same snake oil that that mortgage brokers sold, uh, you know, fifteen years ago. Uh, that that somehow uh, you know I've found a better way to lend money to bad credits that that. Uh, traditional banks and, and uh, lending platforms haven't figured out after a hundred years, um, and 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 we keep relearning this lesson every bull market. Uh, you know, there was a blow up in this space in the late '90s. There was another blow up in this space uh, in in '02. Another blow up, as we know, in '08, '09, and there's probably another blow up in front of us here, whereby companies who, who claim, you know, we haven't figured out with our algorithm. These FICO scores are for the birds. Um, we know how to lend money to bad credits and, and get it back. And it, it, they all look good uh, as the cycle, the credit cycle is expanding. And they all tend to blow up when the credit cycle contracts. Um, you know, Bill Black, who, uh, who, who wrote a great book called The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, you know, has a great <laughs> model I teach in my class about how in financial services, it's really, really easy if you grow fast um, to show record profits because, you know, until the credit cycle turns, all the loans are good and, uh, and, and everything, and you're earning a huge spread. And it's not till the loans go bad that you realize through the cycle that you never made money. And there's a whole ton of these things out there um, that, that, are, that are trading at just insane valuations because they show growth. So they've, they've wrapped themselves as tech stocks where really they're basically subprime lenders. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, I joke to my staff, there is a huge canyon between a high growth um, tech stock and a subprime lender. And when, uh, when the market sees them as, as glass half empty for what they are, uh, just making a lot of questionable loans, um, you know, the, the, the drop in some of these stocks is going to be significant, 80, 90 in some cases, 100%. Yeah, it was um, just recently, one of the best parts about you, know, you being live teaching a class and being back, in, back and forth from New York or us just engaging with humans is that you can really, I think, and it's as a short seller for, I'm dating myself now, but 22 years, um, I, I get a lot out of meeting people like, and, and hearing their, their bull case. Like when I can look them in the eye and hear it through and que ask questions, have a conversation. Um, so I find that very valuable. I was just in Florida uh, with a bunch of um, bunch of people in the business, and this one Texas billionaire who's basically became a billionaire through subprime, you know, and he's like, he couldn't believe like something like a firm had a multiple that the stock was like 150 or 170 bucks a share AFRM. I could, and I said back to him, you know what? I can't believe that I have some of the smartest hedge funds in the world. Um, you know, in, in some cases, uh, obviously, I wouldn't be speaking out of school. There, one in particular wasn't a client, but they this the, a firm was their biggest long position coming into this year, like a buy now pay uh, a later firm company. Loses money, and I think still trades at five or six times tangible book um, as a subprime lender. And here's the other little thing about the firms of the world that I don't think people appreciate: most of them are financing um, themselves through one bank in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And, and is called Cross River Bank. It's privately held. Um, the fellow that runs Cross River is an interesting guy. Um, he was a mortgage broker, CFO of a mortgage brokerage firm on the East Coast during uh, the, the heyday uh, uh, of the real estate bubble. Really? And so now he's, uh, he's basically running this bank that's funding all of these companies, like a firm and upstart. And uh, I would bet you that his bank would not be trading at six or eight or ten times tangible book if it was if it was uh, uh, public. And and look, we have we have comps in this industry that go back forever. Um, you know, uh, the the private private label credit has been around for a long, long time. Yeah. And, and there's not there's not a lot of new under the sun here. But every every bull market, we find a whole other group of investors. Who just seem enamored with top line growth of a of a aggressive subprime lender until they realize that you don't want to grow fast in that business, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably where we are in this part of the cycle. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the best part about these shorts again is it's easy to call their rate of change decelerations and top line 
whatever it is that they were building this TAM multiple on. Uh, well, there's another, and there's another problem. They're basically dependent upon third parties or securitizations. And uh, for a number of these companies, they've already had to pull securitizations or their, their funding costs are starting to go up dramatically. So they have to deal with the credit markets, not just the equity markets. Uh, on that, uh, my last question before I take questions from the queue, if, if you don't mind. W what did you think about the, I mean, uh, Affirm, just to, you know, not to pick on the same company, but you know, why not? Um, they're one of the first companies, along, and then it was Tesla that couldn't get their ABS deals done. Now, um, yeah, I think that's something we're watching. The ABS market is starting to tighten up um, clearly, and, and Firm had that announcement uh, a few weeks back um, that I thought on a Friday night that I thought was significant. They, they claimed it was no big deal, but it is a big deal. And, and again, um, you have to kind of watch what's happening in their correspondent bank relationships. But if rates start going up and stay up, there's a lot of business models out there, not just these guys. There's just a ton of business models that are really dependent upon ultra low interest rates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the solar, the solar panel lessors, for example, the guys putting up solar panels on your roof that that lease them to you. I mean, you know, dependent on two percent and three percent interest rates, and um, uh, commercial real estate, which I'm still scratching my head over. Um, you know, cap rates down at three percent, four percent, five percent for buildings um, just makes no sense to me particularly if government bonds are close to 3%. Um, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you buying a warehouse for? What are you doing this at a 3% cap rate um, where your rents are kind of, you know, pretty much uh, structured? You're basically a bond equivalent. Um, the electric utility industry I've been railing at for now for a while, which is hitting all time highs. The electric utility industry has a return on invested capital, like three, 4% pre-tax. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so, I mean, you, you've got whole industries that have, have kind of feasted on the zero interest rate policy for the last 10 years that are going to you know, probably have a new reality going forward. Uh, I'm not going to mention it, but there's this thing called the hedge fund industry and those who run levered long, like with massive exposure. There's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on out there. Um, all right, I'm going to ask uh, the, these questions get voted up. And there's one, there's one in the queue. I think he says he knows you. So this is from Mike. Mike from the Principality of Monaco. All right. Uh, Jim, at the outset, I should say, I've always enjoyed our discussions when I was at Third Point, so I want to put you on the spot. Uh, what, are the, what are two large or mid-sized companies that present the most compelling short-selling opportunities? <laughs> well, well I, 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 do, I do need to save something for my client base. Um, so uh, so I'll, talk, I'll just talk about things that, that we've, we've been public on um, that that uh, if you follow me on Twitter or whatever you know I've been uh, posting on so those are either public or quasi public. I, look, I do think I do think Coinbase at thirty five billion dollars is nuts. It's just crazy. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it really deserves to be two thirds lower here. Um, you know, if we if it was a, if it was below fifty dollars, we could talk. But but at one hundred and sixty. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, and that's a, that's a fairly large capitalization situation. Um, and as I indicated, you could hedge out if you if you see the correlation to uh, to Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. You can you can hedge, actually hedge that out. Um, that that to us is is a pretty pretty compelling you know mid to large cap opportunity um, that 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 you know is going uh, to use your term is going into quad four. Um, and I think that that uh, uh, in a smaller cap area, uh, you mentioned it earlier, but we, we just scratch our heads on Beyond Meat. Um, mm -hmm. This is this is such a silly promotion. Still trading at six times revenues. Um, uh, it, it it really uh, uh, it, it's it's just a head scratcher for us. Um, their their revenue growth has hit a brick wall. Uh, Wall Street is forecasting a big, big ramp in the second half. But if you look at the Nielsen and IRI data, which we do, uh, retail growth just keep, continues to decelerate at the grocery store. Um, then the street got excited about McDonald's, but the McPlant test seems to be very, very underwhelming. Um, and, and meanwhile, the, the gross margins have imploded. The company is losing a lot of money. And what makes Beyond Meat so interesting is they borrowed money Instead of doing a uh, equity offer in 2021 when their stock was going crazy, they did a convert. 
And that convert is sitting on the books while they burn lots of cash. Um, and you could see Beyond Meat in a couple of years getting into financial trouble. Um, and, and that's not well appreciated for a stock that trades, you know, with only 400 million in revenues, um, wherever it is these days. Uh, so that's a, that's a smaller cap idea and it's got a big short interest, so it's volatile, but it, it's a business that just doesn't seem to be worth anything close to where it's trading, particularly given its debt profile. And there's people uh, with claims ahead of the company on the company than uh, these shareholders. Yeah, they're, they're now talking about a promotional management team and a promotional company. I mean, what I love about that short, Jim, is one, you stayed with it. Uh, two, it's pre all the nonsense that we've talked about so far. I mean, this thing was a bubble that was pre-pandemic, came public, I think, in what, 2019? Uh, and you had many opportunities to short it on rallies and staying with something like that obviously made you a lot of money. Um, this is this this next question was inevitable. You know you're going to probably get it. Uh, thoughts on Elon and Twitter, and are you are you still short Tesla? <laughs> yeah, we still have a we still have a put position in Tesla. Um, look, I mean he's done such a good job in terms of getting to where he has to 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 give Elon the credit as it relates to Tesla. Um, However, and there's a big however, and it, it remains has been my however for years now. This is a car company. It's still a car company. <laughs> it's a car company that's earning 30% gross margins. Um, that is basically on the back of the fact that, that not only are they getting uh, high prices for their cars, but they're selling a product that doesn't exist called full self-driving. Full self-driving was, was released in 2016 at $6,000. Uh, it's still now in beta tests six years later. Uh, they're charging $12,000 for it. Uh, the take rate is, is you know, it's not 100%, certainly, but that's all profit to Tesla. Um, and it, it helps their gross margins dramatically, number one. Number two, at, at $1 trillion or plus, $1.1 trillion valuation, not only do they, uh, is the market cap equal to the entire rest of the global auto industry, and that's been the case for a while, but it's really implying that the 50% unit growth is going to have to continue. I think I mentioned mm -hmm. that the last time I was at your shop. And, and so far it has. But the problem you have is that you have the law of large numbers. The company is supposed to have about a 500,000 run rate uh, of deliveries in the fourth quarter of this year. So that's a 2 million, 2 million unit annualized. Um, in two more years, it's supposed to be 4 million. Um, and uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, the total volume of luxury cars pre-pandemic, $50,000 or more globally, was 2 million units for ICE and uh, EVs. So the street is assuming right now that, that he will basically be doing 200% of all luxury cars sold globally um, in 2024. And then it gets worse from there. Mm -hmm. um, and so... That's the problem this stock has is it has the law of large numbers. It, you know, it, it's got the Cisco problem. Mm -hmm. you know, Cisco got to an insane valuation in 2000 because everybody put their hopes and dreams on it, even though it was still just making routers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was going to be this. It was going to do that. It was going to get into fiber. It was going to do all kinds of things that they never really did. Um, but they never really missed numbers either. And uh, And yet the stock went down 80 some percent. Uh, from 2000 to 02, and, and it's still not back to where it, it peaked in 2000. Um, and I think that's going to be Tesla's problem. At $1 trillion, you've got the world baked into these valuations. Um, and uh, I think out-of-the-money puts still make a lot of sense. This is a bellwether stock. This is the most important retail stock in the market, by the way. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, what is it, eight, 800, 900 billion in market cap still? Over a trillion. A trillion, back to over a trillion. It's hard to keep track. Um, how about Uber? Uh, this question from Bill. In recent years, um, Chain has referred to Uber as a body shop. Um, I, I don't know what that means, but um, that thing's been a dog too, obviously. Yeah, we, we are, we've covered our Uber and Lyft shorts, but we are still short DoorDash. Okay. Um, and and it, food delivery is even worse than ride sharing. Um, <laughs> what I meant by body shop is just that you really were at mercy of not only the labor markets, but labor regulation. And we've long said the gig economy companies were really kind of brilliant in how they, they played regulatory arbitrage 
with the, the labor laws and, and taxation. And basically, by calling their employees independent contractors, they avoided um, all kinds of, of costs that normal employers have and, and foisted that onto, the, uh, onto the, the drivers. And now you've got a real problem because the drivers are having to face higher gasoline pr prices um, and, uh, and higher wages, right? I mean, you know, it used to be that if you drove for Uber and, and made after expenses 10 or $12, you know, it's okay as a part-time gig, whatever, but you can make $20 now on part-time gigs. Um, and, and, uh, and so the labor markets have tightened dramatically for them. Um, and food delivery is still just the toughest business because restaurant margins are very low anyway. And when you put two more outstretched hands, the driver and, uh, and DoorDash or whomever, Grubhub in between, you know, we were short Grubhub and, and, uh, they got bought out, uh, by Just Eat. And, and of course, Grubhub immediately sunk them mm -hmm. because Grubhub's business continued to get worse. And, and, and then finally, the uh, gig economy companies are probably one of the biggest offenders in the pro forma world mm. of all the things that they exclude from their, uh, uh, you know, we're pro forma break even, EBITDA break even. And so you will hear financial TV say, you know, DoorDash expects break even this quarter or next quarter or next year, whatever. And you look at the income statement, they lost a few hundred million dollars that quarter. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it gets back to that same problem. Uh, although I did see a story that I think is important a few weeks ago, and that was was DoorDash was going to uh, start offering more equity to its employees because the stock price had gone down so much. And that's the, that's the problem with equity-based compensation. Uh, if the stock keeps going down, you have to issue more and more stock for the same dollar value. So what was a virtuous circle on the way up is a vicious cycle on the way back down. It's, it's nasty. Some of these shorts, Jim, I mean, just looking at your list of things you've talked about over the years, I guess this is kind of like, I'll take the last question or two. It's, did you think it would take like this long to play out, you know, go bubble to bubble, just taking the barbell of 22 years? Did, did you, do you feel like you need to know? The, the, or I, you... I never, Keith, I never thought I'd see, I mean, in, after the carnage of, of 2000, you know, that on an alpha basis, we, we kind of fed on that for 10 years, really, from, from 1999 to 09. Right. Um, and, and I never thought I'd see that kind of, of speculation again that we saw at the end of the dot-com era in 99 and early 2000. Um, but we did. You know, we saw it in the first half of 2021. And, and uh, you know, with the meme stocks and, and SPACs, and, and you, know, you can just check, go right down the checklist. Um, people lost their damn minds last year at this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never thought we would see that again, um, but we did. And it took a whole generation um, uh, to, to rediscover, you know, buying stocks at 25 times revenues and, uh, and, and, and funding loss-making enterprises with billions and billions of dollars of capital. Um, but here we are. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to try to take advantage of it for the next 10 years. Yeah, I, I, I know you're going to do it till, uh, well, well, you and I will both do this till we're on the wrong side of the grass. And that's what, that's, that's what we love doing, right? It's not like we're bad guys trying to unearth untruths. It's just what it is. <laughs> the, uh, my well, last speak for yourself, Keith. Speak for yourself. So. <laughs> well, my last question on this, and it doesn't one come after the other. In other words, you know, you know, after the bubble starts to pop, don't the bodies eventually rise to the, the dead bodies being rise to the surface on fraud? Yeah. And, and that's really, that's a point you, you, you made quite seriously, as you would any of your points. Um, do you think that, that we're going to go through a whole new cycle of dead bodies floating to the surface on accounting, everything that yeah. you alluded to? I, I think we will. I think a lot of it will be what Bethany McLean calls legal fraud. It's one of the models I teach in my class. And it gets back to this pro forma, not to beat a dead horse, but so many companies now have, have, have portrayed their results quite legally in the eyes of the SEC and the Justice Department in, a, in ways in which defy reality that they're just simply going to point to that and say, look, look you, you know, the 10 Qs have the real numbers. Um, you, you let us put this in our press releases and our conference calls. Um, so, you know, the, sorry. 
Um, so <laughs> I think that that uh, the fraud cycle will follow the uh, the business cycle. It always does. I think we'll see a lot of it. We've already seen some of it. Some of it's been in the private sector, like Theranos. Um, you know, others we've seen a few kind of glimpses along the way, like our friends at Valiant back five years ago. Um, but I think that that the real the real losses are going to be in these companies that were just never profitable and told people they were. And uh, investors are going to say, well, wait a minute, you know, how did I lose all of my money in, in this sports gambling company or this company or whatever? Um, I was told that uh, pro forma, everything was getting better and uh, they filed chapter 11. And so uh, that will be the problem. But, it, but also keep in mind that, that I also basically teach that stock price is the fiercest defense attorney um, and also the greatest prosecutor. Um, <laughs> it's not until people actually do start losing money that you get public uh, public outcry um, to, to tighten up regulations and laws. And again, we'll see that as well in the crypto area. As it regards to your first point about bodies floating up, I mean, we already have them. Just people aren't, aren't kind of noticing I mean, there has been an absolute carnage in my industry in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, the long, short world has not acquitted itself uh, well. Um, and, and there's some, some, you know, basically big names uh, in our industry that are down, you know, 40 percent, 30 percent with the S&P up. Um, so it's not just, you know, well-known um, managers uh, uh, like uh, like Kathy Wood or others. Uh, it's it's a lot of hedge funds have gotten kind of drank the Kool-Aid last year. They abandoned their shorts just at the time they should have been adding to them and then, you know, bought up lots of tech stocks or Chinese stocks. Mm -hmm. And that's also that's also, you know, the, the history of the in, of the industry. It's a whole new cattle class. I always say of new analysts starting at new funds and they have to make the same mistakes that the other ones did. And again, it's it's what it is. It's um, it's cyclical, I guess I would say. Uh, but thank you so much for for your time, man. I mean, it's like it's great to see you. It's great to see you. you're you're fully loaded you know, for bear here. <laughs> you got it. You're gonna so take to it. You're gonna take it from New Haven to New York and back again. And uh, for those, and I'm sure everybody's you know fired up to to take your class. So well done on you for 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 making the time to do that for them. I love doing it. I've got great, great students and, and both Yale and University of Wisconsin give me a lot of uh, support. So I appreciate that. I like that. Both red and blue. See how he, the guy, the guy, you know, he goes both ways too. All right. Jim Chanos, the man. Uh, again, he goes long and short and, and, and spend some time, maybe rewind this one. You know, this is one of the great short sellers of all time and has done it in a way that's quite surgical. He has his methodology. You can go back and review uh, our prior discussions at the Hedge Eye Summit with, with Jim Chanos. And again, you're only going to learn things when you listen to him. Thanks for spending your time with us today. We appreciate it.